boundary concept originates from the growing scientific evidence that, first of all, that humanity is now putting increasing and, and accelerated pressure on processes at the Earth system scale, at the planetary scale, and secondly, that we've learned that the planet is a self-regulating, complex, interactive system that depends on a number of processes to remain stable and provide the basis for human development. Now, the planetary boundary concept asks the question, or try to answer the question, what are the processes at the planetary scale that we have to be stewards of to assure that the planet can continue to support human development? And if you future. can identify the processes that we need to be stewards of to stay safe, and if we can even identify thresholds and place safe boundaries around them, then it provides humanity with what we call a safe operating space for development. And when offering this concept to leading global change scientists, the answer was that we have nine big processes that we need to be stewards of. And interestingly, of course, climate change is one, but only one among nine. And it also includes the stratospheric ozone layer, it includes ocean acidification, and then it includes perhaps less obvious or more surprising processes such as the global nutrient cycles of nitrogen and phosphorus, land use, fresh water use, the rate of biodiversity loss, and biodiversity being increasingly understood as one of the key toolboxes to maintain resilience in the planet. And then it also includes freshwater use at the planetary scale, air pollution, and toxic chemical pollution. So, an identification of nine larger processes <coughs> that form and interact to, to say, sustain the planet in a, in a stable state. And for seven of these nine, <coughs> this research group even suggests quantified safe boundary levels. So it really starts to show that science can provide humanity with a quantifiable safe space. Well, the planet is clearly in a, in a dire state. Um, we see that from the 1950s until today, we have accelerated pressures on all the boundaries. And, um, and the, the drama is that up until the 1950s, we, we see that the old model for growth and, and for human expansion, human use of, of the planetary space and the planetary resources and its ecosystems largely could ignore um, externalities and impacts at the larger scale. But from the 1950s onwards, we enter this exponential growth phase where we, we see that we're starting to have changes in the planetary scale as a whole. So there, there's no, it's not a coincidence that the planetary boundary concept comes right after the proposition that humanity may have entered a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, Anthros for humans, that we are now, as humanity, the largest geological force of change at the planetary scale. So, so the planet is, is under unprecedented stress. Now, still humans and humanity is an integral part. We are part of the Earth system. We are ecosystem engineers in our own right. So this is not to so say punish humanity or, or judge humanity in, in, in stating that we are now the dominant force. It's simply to say, well, if we are the dominant force, and we depend on the Earth system for our own well-being, well then we must simply now define boundaries within which we can operate safely. And um, so there's no doubt that, of course, the boundaries analysis comes at a point in time where it's urgent also to recognize boundaries. There's no doubt, uh, I think, in anyone's mind that it will require growth particularly in the majority of the world's nations that today are rapidly climbing from poverty into some kind of minimum level of affluence, which, which one should remember is actually the majority of the world's people. So, of course, it's not growth that is good or bad, it's simply what type of growth. And what we need to see is, is, a, is, a, is a new type of dematerialized growth that closes loops in all the planetary boundaries. Now, the, the drama is that we cannot conceive of such a growth model today. And we know that the current economic paradigm does not support a transition towards that kind of growth model. So we have um, big limitations in the current growth, the current economic model, because 
it, it does not price natural capital fully and it does not address the global commons. Um, so, so we have an enormous challenge of building into the economic model uh, a full economic valuation of both local natural capital and regulating services at the global scale. And then we need to have you know, a, a growth paradigm that acknowledges that um, there is even here, and this is the most sensitive part, there is even here this absolute necessity of, of redistribution of access to capital. And when you redistribute access to capital, in this case natural capital, you, you, you automatically actually redistribute wealth. Because what, what we fail to recognize is that the financial crisis was a tremendous uh, subsidy on credit. It, it, was, it, was a, it was an enormous subsidy of overuse of credit, which has been supplied for a long time by an enormous overuse and subsidy of cheap labor from poor developing countries. But the third subsidy is, of course, the planetary life support system. So the, the growth today in the rich parts of the world are subsidized by finance and credit, cheap labor, and natural capital. Now, if you want to sort all these three out at the same time, which we need to do, then, of course, it will pull down the growth trajectories for many economies in the world, which will create a large, large amount of turbulence which is the dilemma because we're addicted to growth because it's the only way to keep stability in, in nations and to be able to pay off debt in, in economies. So nobody has the answer to this at the current state. We can only conclude that science supports that we have an enormous dilemma that the current economic model does not respond to the needs of a global transition towards sustainability within a safe operating space. But I don't, I don't see growth necessarily being the, the big problem. It's rather to address the economic paradigm, where the, the economic model we're in. And, and, and one step towards a solution here, or two steps, is of course to redefine GDP and go beyond GDP to incorporate. So it's, it's, it's absurd that you increase your GDP by chopping down forests, or you increase your GDP by degrading land, or you increase GDP by intoxicating your environment. So that has to change, of course, yesterday. And then we need to put economic value on natural capital and, 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 and can't, it can't be done without it. And a very pragmatic step in Rio would be to take the step and introduce a global carbon tax. Now everyone talks of that as utopia, but that to me is very surprising because I mean in 1987 we didn't put a tax on chlorofluorocarbons to address the depletion of the ozone layer. We forbid it. We, 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 we said no more freons in our cooling systems. Now the industry was ready to move, but the industry is ready to move also now on decarbonizing our economies. So why should... Why I would say the following. I mean, the, the Rio conference in 1992 was hugely important. It was very successful, but it really did not address what we need today because it was largely a, a meeting that produced an outcome where the goal was to minimize environmental impacts within a given growth model. It did not recognize that things now have to add up at the global scale within sustainability or, or sustainable boundaries. So 20 years on, we have scientific evidence to say that we are in the global phase of sustainable development, while in Rio, we were largely still operating at the sector scale or the nation state scale or the local scale. So the message now is that we need to collaborate as humans on the planet to deal with all these big issues, these nine planetary boundaries, as, as a global collective. I mean, there's no agenda on land at the global scale. There's no agenda on freshwater at the global scale. There's no agenda on nitrogen at the global scale. There's no agenda on phosphorus at the global scale. So y you can see that in Rio 2012, what we need is to start recognizing that, of course, we will continue having nation states as, as the fundamental unit for accounting and, and, and for development, but we now need global governance at an unprecedented scale with teeth. So one concrete 
action in, in, in Rio is, for example, to upgrade UNEP into a fully specialized UN agency with the authority to govern the planetary boundaries and, and to do that in ways that enforces policy and which also can monitor and evaluate progress. Because as we're operating now, I mean, on climate, for example, the, the belief that we, we cannot get a global agreement on climate, therefore we'll, we'll let a thousand flowers bloom from below, is an enormous risk for humanity. Because what if it doesn't add up? And we're not seeing any evidence on any of the Rio conventions that a bottom-up approach is enough. We need a lot of bottom-up innovation, but we need top-down regulation to, to, to couple, um, because otherwise it won't work. I mean, 20 years back, or even more 40 years back, we could allow ourselves to take the risk of let, let innovation operate from below and let's meet in 20 years time and hope that we're still within safe boundaries. But because we're hitting the ceiling now, the time has run out for that approach. So the real approach does not work anymore. You cannot just allow 200 countries to run home and do Agenda 21 anymore. You simply need now to upfront cap what is the global total aggregate number which means, for example, that for land, if we recognize that we need to increase food production in the world by 70% to address 1 billion hungry and a world that will approach 9 billion people, of which all new, all net increase will be in today poor countries, you need to redistribute land management across the world. You have to have a, a, an equity and science-based redistribution of access to land. You have to have a redistribution of access to nitrogen because you cannot just continue having overuse in some parts of the world and underuse in other parts of the world.